And can I say from the outset, thank you very much, Georgina, for inviting me. Also, Nina, uh, Zach, uh, for inviting me. Uh, I run a think tank that's been around for 45 years or so. And um, I can't imagine what it would be like to create a think tank and get it going. So more power to you, Georgina, given that it has been just a year since you started. Um, we mentioned some wit of Robert Menzies, and I thought <clears throat> not enough has been said about his wit. Um, there were many times when he would speak at rallies and he'd face protesters and hecklers. And once <clears throat> a heckler said, tell us what you know, Menzies, it won't take long. To which Menzies replied, I tell you what, I tell you what we both know, and it won't take any longer. <laughs> My other favourite bit of Menzies' wit was at an election rally and some heckler intervened and said, Menzies, I wouldn't vote for you if you were the Archangel Gabriel. And uh, to which Menzies replied, Madam, if I were the Archangel Gabriel, I'm afraid you would not be in my constituency. <laughs> Um, my other favourite Nixon um, Menzies stories relates to something that's written in that wonderful collection of essays or letters by his daughter Heather Henderson that was published about ten or so years ago. Letters to my daughter, and there was one letter that really struck me, and it was about his time in Washington in early February. 1969. So this is three years after Menzies leaves office <clears throat> and defies Enoch Powell's doctrine that all political careers end in failure. So three hours since he left, three three days since he left power, <clears throat> three years. And February 1969. It's just within a few weeks of Robert Menzies witnessing Richard Nixon's presidential inauguration. And Nixon invited the former Prime Minister to the Oval Office for a private lunch. <clears throat> and the other distinguished guests included a very young National Security Advisor, Henry Kissinger, who at this stage was not a household name, <clears throat> the Secretary of State, Will Rogers, and Thomas Dewey, who was the Republican candidate in the 1948 presidential election against Harry Truman, and two senior State Department figures on East Asia. And you just think about that. A former prime minister, three years after leaving office, being courted by the most powerful man in the world in his private office within just weeks of his inauguration. But the episode was more curious for another reason, and this is what Menzies told his daughter. Quote, while the new president and all the others present put questions to me and were anxious to get my views and where possible, my advice, Menzies went on to say, I was able to look back with a wry smile and remember that since I retired three years earlier, no member of the administration in Australia, or for that matter, no member of parliament, has ever asked me for my views on anything. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? So he was seen as a bit of a fuddy-duddy, unfortunately, in Australia in that period in the mid to late 60s, but he was lionised by the President of the United States. And Nixon and uh, Menzies did have a good relationship. Uh, I found a document that's not related to my talk today. <clears throat> it was in September 65 when Nixon was widely regarded as, uh, you know, discredited, damaged goods because he lost the president, presidential election to John F. Kennedy in 1960. And then he lost the governorship of California to Pat Brown in 1962. These were Nixon's wilderness years and it was widely believed that his political obituary had been written. And Nixon came to Australia in September 65 and spent a night with Robert Menzies at the Kirribilli House, and they had a lovely dinner together. And the next day, Nixon wrote Menzies a letter where he said something along the lines that, please tell me that one day when you retire from office, you will write a book about great political comebacks. <clears throat> 
how is it that someone like you who was damaged goods after the 41 election, particularly after the 43 and 46 elections, how did you come back and be in power for so long? And um, it's a very important lesson for all politicians who have been written off. And there is a book still to be written on that very subject. One day I'd love to do it, but it requires a lot of work because you need to get inside the, um, the psycho psychology of the individual, how they can bounce back and see that every time the critics give him the kiss of death, it's just mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. <laughs> and that's what happened with Menzies and indeed Nixon and various other politicians. I want to just start by acknowledging various secondary sources for this paper. I don't claim to be uh, a, a, an historian, although I did study history, uh, and I haven't looked at the primary documents on these issues, but um, I think it's important just to say from the outset that I'm indebted to David Kemp. As you all probably know, David has published five volumes of liberalism, and in my judgment, his best one is uh, volume four. Uh, how Australians Chose Liberalism Over Socialism. Now, he talks about the period from 1926 to 1966. As you can imagine, a lot of that explains Menzies and his economic policy thinking from 49 right through to 66. I'm also indebted to Alan Martin, the great biographer of Robert Menzies. He wrote two volumes. I focus on the second volume of Robert Menzies from 43 until his death in 78. John Howard's The Menzies Years is also very important. Um, and Paul Kelly, a special praise to Paul, my former colleague at the Australian newspaper. Paul, um, <clears throat> in 2001, published uh, a book uh, about Australian Federation. This was to mark the centenary of the Federation from 1901. And that book was later turned into a series for both ABC's Radio National and ABC Television. And it is, in my judgment, the best documentary uh, any Australian outlet has, has, has broadcast. There are five episodes and they talk about the different stages of the Australian settlement uh, from 1901 onwards. <clears throat> so I do rely quite a bit on um, Paul Kelly. I should also stress from the outset that it'd be remiss not to acknowledge Anne Henderson and the work she has just done on the question of bank nationalisation. I won't focus on that too much for obvious reasons, but I think it's nevertheless important to put my paper in the context of uh, bank nationalism debates in the late 1940s. As Anne made it very clear, Chifley embarked on the nationalisation of the private banks in 1947, and it was the first and only attempt by the federal ALP to introduce socialism into this country, and was obviously the most contentious economic policy decision. Um, it represented, as Anne made very clear, the death knell of the Labor government of that period from 1941 to 1949. But it also <clears throat> gave the kiss of political life to Robert Menzies. As Anne made it clear, it was widespread debunking of Robert Menzies as a political leader. You can't win with Menzies. Um, and Menzies used this issue of the bank nationalisation to great effect. He launched a free enterprise campaign against, quote, dictatorship at home. And in his policy speech, Menzies in the late 40s pledged to repeal the law, but his overarching theme was to the need to repudiate socialism. And his main slogan was, a vote for Labor is a vote for socialism. And obviously, bank nationalisation was the prime exhibit. He attacked the myth of the moderate Ben Chifley, and as Anne made clear, as a consequence, Robert Menzies won the 49 election uh, with a 74-47 coalition majority. This was a new era of private enterprise and the repudiation of socialism. Now, Menzies saw the significance of this issue for Australians as being the link between nationalisation and their own private property rights. And as Paul Kelly made it clear, it's in fact the link between capitalism and liberty, the link that Australian socialists underestimated. Many Australians saw a potential threat to their own life implicit in the creation of a government-owned and controlled bank monopoly. Paul Kelly says there are three lessons 
First, that Labor best governed by focusing on middle-of-the-road brands of government intervention. Second, that the public valued the economic and moral benefits of free enterprise. And thirdly, and crucially for today's discussion, that the nationalisation issue was exploited by Menzies not to repudiate government intervention and state power, but to position himself as its most successful champion. I want to repeat that. These are Kelly's words. The nationalisation issue was exploited by Menzies not to repudiate government intervention and state power, but to position himself as its most successful champion. And this, according to Kelly, was Labor's real defeat. Now, as is widely known, the 1949 election delivered the post-war prosperity uh, in the 50s and the 60s. This was the post-war structure that Chifley and Curtin created. It's been marvellously told by the late historian Stuart McIntyre called the boldest experiment. But these legacies would be enjoyed by not Chifley and the Labor Party, but Robert Menzies. He skillfully turned this into a Liberal Party issue. That is, in office, Menzies only enhanced the economic framework he inherited from his Labor predecessors. This was about civilising capitalism. It was Menzies who consolidated and gave expression to this enduring post-war legacy. Menzies could claim ownership of it. And that's why Paul Keating, who was one of Menzies' staunchest critics, uh, particularly in the 1990s when Keating was Prime Minister, hardly a day went by without Prime Minister Keating bagging the Menzies' legacy in Parliament. And he later lamented, quote, We, Labor, we built the post-war structures and gave it to the Liberal Party. We gave it to Menzies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Classic Keating. So I think the point to bear in mind here is that Menzies was a man of his time. He's, he's a creature of his culture. And a, a classic case in point is what he did after the December 49 election. Now, there were calls, particularly within uh, the co-governing country party, the Black National Party, to cleanse the public service, all the public servants, the civil servants who'd been aiding and abetting the Chifley uh, curtain agenda, there was a call from his own ranks for Menzies to cleanse the civil service or the public service from those who served Chifley in curtain. But Menzies had no purge of bureaucrats upon his victory in '49. And I think this is important. He retained the services of Nugget Coombs. Nugget Coombs, uh, a major public servant during this period, including to the 50s and so on, he relied on Coombs. Menzies valued his public service and usually took their advice. Um, now, in policy terms, Menzies brought to its finest pitch this point about civilising capitalism. And if you look at the period, unemployment hovered around 1% to 1.5%. Home ownership grew. But the role of the Commonwealth government expanded. Um, Menzies was dedicated to the growth of Canberra uh, as a city and the capital. Arbitration and protection, the foundation of Australian institutions, were upheld and advanced. There was no such thing as industrial relations reform. And of course, the Chifley's immigration program to populate or perish, uh, implemented by uh, the immigration minister, Arthur Corwell, who later served as the opposition leader against Menzies in the 1960s. Menzies kept that going and kept the white Australia policy. <clears throat> I think this is an important point to bear in mind, although this is hardly a novel observation. Usually when I write columns and write papers, I do try to challenge the conventional wisdom uh, for various reasons. It's just always healthy to question orthodoxies. But in this case, I'm just going to reflect the orthodoxy because I think the overwhelming consensus is right, that Menzies 
was a creature of the old Australian settlement. This is a term that I think Gerard Henderson used uh, or coined and it was uh, uh, popularised by Paul Kelly in his famous book, The End of Certainty. The Australian settlement, the, the, the strong settlement of federation. So in other words, a deaconite liberal. This is the old deaconite liberal tradition. So you had high tariffs, very centralised industrial relations system, uh, a restrictive immigration policy to keep out cheap Asian labour uh, to help boost the unions. That had long been part of the Australian ethos, the federation right through to the late 40s and early 50s when Keynesianism became popularised. We'll get to that in a moment. Menzies lived in a different age and he believed in a form of progressive politics, which is why he wanted the new party to bear the name Liberal. Menzies, above all else, was dedicated to the notion of public service. Again, as Kelly points out, Menzies' view of government was measured and utilitarian. It should keep out of people's way unless it was helping them, which was its main function. Menzies achieved a better balance than any of his predecessors had between free enterprise and state intervention. His era, the 50s and the 60s, was marked by certainty and predictability, qualities much appreciated after the Depression in the 1930s and, of course, World War II in the 40s. He was conservative. He was cautious. His technique was to delay changes until the public was ready for them. I mentioned John Maynard Keynes before. Menzies, as David Kett points out in his book, uh, The Liberal State, actually met uh, John Maynard Keynes several years earlier. <clears throat> well, Keynes died, I think, in 46, so I think he met him in the 30s. Um, in Keynesianism, as many of you, I'm sure, know, uh, based on the writings of the distinguished British columnist John Maynard Keynes and his famous general theory of employment, interest and money, was about correct, the government's role in correcting market failure to generate full employment. And this was obviously a natural fit uh, for the Labor Party in the 40s of Curtin and Chifley. Um, Chifley's biographer, Finn Crisp, asserted that he was, that is, Chif, a Keynesian of the hour. Coombs made it very clear that there was very little difference between Chifley and Curtin in their embrace of Keynesianism. But, again, this is a crucial point of the narrative. The feature of Keynesianism in this country, as revealed after the 1949 election, was its bipartisan tone. Remember, Coombs advised Curtin, Chifley and Menzies, and he captured the significance of this transformation in his memoirs. Quote, None of us, I think, would have believed that 30 years would pass before unemployment again became a serious concern in economic management. And this was due, according to the conventional wisdom, as the application of Keynesian economics. The welfare state marched forward. Public enterprise from Qantas and TAA uh, to the Commonwealth Bank, uh, state-funded Commonwealth Bank, strongly supported. There was bipartisan support for demobilisation of training schemes for ex-servicemen, commissions on inquiry to study particular aspects of the post-war scene, such as agricultural policy, housing and social security. John Howard makes the point in his excellent book on the Menzies years that the willingness of governments to intervene in the economy through deficit financing when necessary to either expand or reduce demand, this was the nature of Keynesianism, that was seen to have played a large role in delivering the stable economic expansion of that post-war period. A centralised waste fixation system, there was a government body called the Wool Corporation, which brought up to 80% of wool crop in one year in the vain hope of maintaining a wool price that the market were never validated. Income tax rates were about 60%. Sorry, the top rate of income tax is now 47%. Add to the Medicare levy, it's about 49%. In those days, it was 
There was a consensus against bank nationalisation, but that went to the fundamental question of restricting free enterprise, namely the right of the private banks to continue operating. This is the key point. Not the government's intervention in the economy so that the conditions in which enterprise operated were as stable and accommodating as possible. We mentioned the university system before, 57. Uh, and I'll just conclude with just two quotes from Robert Menzies that deal with his question of uh, the role of government. 64, so two years before he leaves office, quote, where government action or control has seemed to us to be the best answer to a practical problem, we have adopted that answer at the risk of being called socialists. In a speech in 1970, so four years after he leaves office, quote, the ancient idea that government's only function was to keep the ring while the private enterprise contestants slog it out has no place in our liberal philosophy. Menzies, on the contrary, we recognise that the state has very wide responsibilities by appropriate economic and monetary measures to assist in preventing large-scale unemployment by social and industrial legislation to provide a high degree of economic security and justice for all its citizens. It must have progressive housing policies, accept greater responsibilities in such disparate matters as education and transportation, ports and railways. So in conclusion, this long reign of Menzies, starting in 49, did not represent any major economic realignment. It's a fundamental point that can't be challenged. As a creature of his culture, Menzies was from the Deaconite liberal tradition. He embraced Keynesianism. He was not a disciple of Friedrich Hayek or Milton Friedman. And he was hardly the harbinger for the Burke Kelly and John Hyde School of Liberalism. <laughs> and with that, I'm happy to take questions. Very provocative, and uh, I think there'll be some different uh, different views and very interesting questions. Uh, can I see any hands up? Thank you, Nicole. Tom, you said you, I think you said you weren't going to be controversial, but I think did you, to my mind, you were quite controversial. Are you saying that Robert Menzies was actually a Labor Prime Minister in disguise? <laughs> Well, look, I should say, Nicole, um, analysis is not endorsement. I mean, I run a, a, a centre-right classical liberal think tank that un unashamedly embraces market economics, but we have to put things in their context. This was a different era. I mean, Menzies uh, was a creature of that culture, and John Howard and Alan Martin, Paul Kelly, Jared Henderson, they all make it very clear that he was from a different time and place. And, you know, from the perspective of the times, the policies did work but they couldn't last forever. And eventually in the 70s, when we did sustain a serious external shock with the OPEC oil crisis, and then especially in the mid-80s with the balance of pay payments crisis and the, the, dollar, the Aussie dollar crisis, that spurred both sides of politics to basically reorder the policy settings and embrace a more classical liberal framework. So, you know, Anne mentioned financial market deregulation, floating of the dollar, privatising various state-run industries, competition policy, tariff cuts, uh, all of that, that was cut from a completely different cloth from that era in the 40s, 50s and 60s. And again, it's not controversial to say that. This is the widespread view. I'm just reflecting the orthodoxy. I wish I could challenge it. And I have relied on secondary sources for this talk, but in my paper, which will hopefully be published in a year, I will... Try to find some good primary documents to support your argument. <laughs> um, Tom, thank you. Um, I don't think what you said is controversial at all. I think it's incontestably right. And uh, I actually wrote my thesis on this very topic many, many years ago. And the, what, what years were the uh, were you covering in your thesis? Uh, mainly the 1940s and, me, and the development of Menzies thinking in the 40s. Right. Is um, that published? No. Um, because I might use it. Though I have subsequently <laughs> published other um, uh, uh, other things that sort of der der uh, derive from it. 
But the point I'd make to you is this, that until the 1980s, when there was a bit of a tussle for you know, the Menzies legacy, there was no doubt whatsoever that Menzies, as you say, was a deaconite liberal. Mm-hmm. Um, that was importantly, among other things, because he was vict- from Victoria mm-hmm. and Melbourne was and the, you know, the seat of deaconite liberalism. Um, and let me um, point out that uh, two people who sat in cabinet with him, one a Victorian, Harold Holt, and one a Western Australian, Paul Hasluck, gave lectures not very long after Menzies' retirement In Holt's case, the inaugural Alfred Deakin lecture, which is published, and in Harold and um, Paul Hasluck's case, uh, a lecture which he gave, I think it was one of the Menzies, the inaugural Menzies lecture. Yes, nineteen eighty. I think it was in about nineteen seventy or thereabouts. But both of them in those lectures, and these are his colleagues who sat in cabinet with him throughout the fifties and sixties, were quite explicit in their um, testimony that Menzies identified himself in the Deaconite Victorian Mm -hmm. liberal progressive tradition, which is the point uh, you make. Now, I think progressive has a different meaning in the 2020s than it did in the 1960s, of course. Um, The the real turning point, I think, was the debate over economic policy, largely kicked off by John Howard more than anyone else, but following people like John Hyde Mm -hmm. um, and Bert Kelly Mm -hmm. in the 1980s when the Liberal Party went into opposition. And in Howard's own Deakin lecture uh, in the 1980s during his first time as opposition, term as opposition leader, he takes on the Deaconite tradition um, head on without acknowledging that in doing so he's taking on the Menzies tradition of economic policy as well. Lastly, um, you can add to those scholars who um, support the view you've articulated, Nick Cater, who writes about this as well in his book, The Lucky Culture. Uh Lucky Culture, right. He deals with Menzies' economic thinking in the late 40s, early 50s. I have looked at that book, but that was a while ago. No, 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 no. I, I didn't just uh, thank you for that feedback, George. That was most helpful. Uh, just a quick one: Howard Alfred, the the Deacon lecture in the eighties. Was that what eighty four? Uh, no, eighty. Yeah, it would have been eighty five, eighty six. Yeah, yeah. Right. Ah, uh, you do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just sorry. Was Howard talking a lot about Menzies being a creature of that culture in the Deacon art tradition? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but Howard would recognise that he's also attacking the Menzies' economic record. Yes. This is, this is why, I, I mean, I'm surprised that people think it's controversial what I'm saying. It's... Uh-huh, good. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Tom. I'm not surprised by anything you've said. And as the partner of someone who wrote the IR Club article that was seminal seminal and has been accused by the ACTU uh, (laughs) leader of being the nasty man who started the whole of the, you know, the industrial (laughs) relations change. I absolutely agree. But there is something that Menzies did that was different from Deakin. At the time when Britain was going strongly into social welfare, socialisation, Mm -hmm. and that was both sides of politics, which Margaret Thatcher had, had to come along and wreck in the 1980s, Menzies did stop that happening here. And I'd like you to, co- to reflect on that because we could have gone quite a different way and when all those lefties say it was a sleepy hollow period of, of, of life in, in the world, in Australia, it wasn't. We actually stopped becoming an absolutely dead period economically because of Menzies. So if you could reflect on that a little bit, by not allowing what happened in Britain to happen here, yes. Menzies actually was instrumental in the fact yeah, that we I, had I, a much I've more prosperous Australia. I've been conscious of that very sound point you make, Anne, and, um, uh, you know, there, there were some areas where he distinguished himself from Labor during this period, but uh, I couldn't find that much. So I'm going to look at Menzies and Evert uh, in the 50s on this economic question. Um, 
But remember, some of the horror budgets that Menzies and Harold Holt, or sorry, it's Fadden first and then Harold Holt, the horror budgets, I think it was 51, and then the credit squeeze budget, which we don't really cover in this uh, setting, but that was in 61, the credit squeeze budget. I mean, Menzies and the, his treasurers were talking about big tax increases to ward off inflation. Um, now, I suspect that the Labor Party supported that, but... Um, I mean, if they didn't, that means this is a case of where Menzies is clearly putting it to the left of the Labor opposition on those budgets. So it is a complicated state of affairs, but there are clearly uh, examples to support your case, but I, I need to find them, and I haven't really found them in, um, in Kelly's work or in um, Howard's work. And I think Kemp might have to deal with this. I'll have to reread Kemp on that issue, but thank you very much. That's, that's a very good, crucial point. But they're differences in degree, not kind. That's what I'd say. Yeah. Free trader. Correct me if I'm wrong, just to challenge you slightly, wasn't one of the key areas of difference between George Reid and Deakin on the question of trade? Deakin was a protectionist and Reid was a free trader? <laughs> Okay. Um, are you familiar with uh, anything that Vladimir Lenin said about Australia in the early 1900s? Yeah, a great social laboratory. And Lenin, I think, I have to look this up, but Lenin, you just reminded me inadvertently, Lenin praised Australia as a great embodiment of socialism. Yeah. <laughs> No, but it might have changed in 49, or if the bank nationalism got up. Thank you very much, Tom. My pleasure. Thank Great you very time. much. Thank you. Thank you.